Hey there everyone! So I had this idea while I was preparing for class this morning to do a quick lecture for you guys about early Christian art. So one of my favorite historical topics to study is art history, but I know it's something that not a lot of high schoolers are necessarily exposed to, so I thought it would be fun to talk to you guys for a minute or two here about the origins of Christian art um, during the days of the early church, which we're studying uh, right now. Okay, so the key thing to keep in mind when studying Christian art is the importance of symbolism. Now, symbolism in artwork has incredible power to communicate ideas and move the mind, spirit, and heart. No one understood this better than the first Christian artists. So, for various reasons, these early Christians developed a highly symbolic style of art. All right, so it's important to remember that the early Christians lived in a culture that persecuted them, but also really influenced them. Thus, early Christian art was very influenced by Greco-Roman culture. Now, the art of the Roman Empire was kind of a blend of Greek and Roman styles. Greek art was often quite symbolic, focused on communicating ideals, such as what would the ideal man look like? What would the ideal woman look like? What would the ideal hero be like, okay? Roman art, on the other hand, was more realistic, more materialistic. So some Christian artists uh, imitated Greco-Roman styles and imitated Greco-Roman artists by using the same techniques and materials and that sort of thing. For example, there's a piece called the Sarcophagus of Junius Bassus, which was um, commissioned for a wealthy uh, Christian Roman nobleman. Um, and a sarcophagus is just an elaborately sculpted, very elaborately decorated coffin, basically, for a rich Roman person. Okay? You'll see here in the picture that it's sculpted in the Greco-Roman style, but it depicts stories from the Old and New Testament as opposed to Greco-Roman mythology. As you can see in the picture, you have in the top row from left to right depictions of the sacrifice of Isaac, the arrest of Peter... There in the middle, you have Jesus on the throne with Peter and Paul. Then next to that, you have the trial of Jesus. In the corner, you have Pilate washing his hands of the blood of Jesus. Uh, and then if you look in the bottom row there, from left to right, we see Job and his friends, Adam and Eve, Jesus's triumphal entry, Daniel, um, and Daniel in the lion's den, and the arrest of Paul. Okay, so there is an example of a Christian artist copying Roman sculpture style. Now, on the other hand, many Christians rejected the Greco-Roman uh, culture and its art. These artists kind of scorned what they saw as the shallow materialism of Roman art and focused instead on using symbolism um, to re um, depict religious Christian ideas. Okay, so because of persecution, Christian artists often used disguised symbolism that only other Christians would understand. So the Cairo and the Alpha and Omega symbols are examples of this. This is the Cairo, an early Christian symbol for the name of Jesus. The Cairo is composed of the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. Early Christians would have understood that this symbol meant Jesus is king. But to the average Roman just walking down the street, it would have just been two random letters and they wouldn't have known it was uh, a Christian symbol. The Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And in Revelation 22, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. So Christians would have used these letters, the first and last letters, kind of like the A and Z in our alphabet, to remind each other of Jesus' eternal rule. Okay? Christians also use the drawing of a fish, you've probably seen this one, to identify themselves to other believers. The Greek word for fish, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but the Greek word for fish was ichthys. The letters in the Greek word ichthys can be used to form an acrostic of the phrase in Greek, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Early Christians would have understood the hidden meaning of of these common Greek letters, words, and phrases, but it would have been hidden um, to people who weren't Christians. They wouldn't necessarily have known, oh, this is Christian art, we need to turn the Christian in who lives here. 
Um, Christians also use Roman styles of artwork to disguise Christian meanings in other ways. For example, a shepherd caring for his sheep is an example of a pagan image that Christians adopted in a lot of their early art. Images of shepherds were common in Roman art. The Roman gods Hermes and Orpheus were represented as shepherds in Greco-Roman art. So early Christians used that imagery to symbolize Jesus instead, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. So depictions of shepherds were very common in early Christian art. All right, so records of Christian art from the first century after Christ are almost uh, non-existent, and scholars, historians debate why examples of early, early Christian art are so rare. It may be because the early Christians didn't want to create art or they didn't have the resources to create art. Um, however, that fear of persecution that they lived with on a regular basis was certainly an important factor in that. So Christian art first appears for us in the second century in the Christian catacombs. So the catacombs, like we studied, were these underground tunnels that were used by Romans for burials. And Christians would also bury their dead there and maybe hide there if they needed some place to hide. Christians would often paint the walls of these catacombs. And so, for example, the catacombs of Priscilla in Rome contain some of the earliest and best and coolest examples of early Christian art that are just overflowing, just in beautiful Christian symbolism. Um, the walls of the various rooms in the catacombs are covered with these beautiful frescoes of biblical scenes, these beautiful paintings. Um, one fresco depicts a bunch of people eating a meal together surrounded by baskets. Um, so it could symbolize either Jesus feeding the 5,000, that story is in Matthew chapter 14, or Jesus' institution of communion with his disciples. Jesus called himself the bread of life in the gospel. So early Christian art often depicts bread or people having meals together as being symbolic of Jesus. Okay? Perhaps the most famous fresco in these catacombs pictures a woman praying with lifted hands and it also depicts Jesus as a shepherd surrounded by peacocks and doves. So uh, in early Christian symbolism, peacocks actually represented eternal life and the doves could also represent eternal life, um, but doves also symbolize the Holy Spirit. So, of course, the cross has been the most important symbol in Christian art since the time of Christ. There are more than 400 variations on the cross symbol, believe it or not. The Latin cross is the closest in shape to an actual Roman cross. So it's the one you're most familiar with, just the regular cross shape. The Greek cross is the same shape, but its four arms are equal length. And it's kind of the symbol of Eastern Christianity. Um, like the eastern half of the Roman Empire after the empire split. It also became what's known as the Cross of St. George when it was brought back to England by Crusaders later on in the Middle Ages. Um, the Anchor Cross combines the symbol of a cross and an anchor, which symbolizes the hope that we have in Christ. St. Andrew's Cross is shaped like the letter X because Christian tradition says that the Apostle Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. This uh, is a cross on the Scottish flag because St. Andrew's cross and then also the Celtic cross, which symbolized eternal life in Christ, both became very popular in the British Isles in the early Middle Ages. Um, so, as the church grew and Christianity became the official religion of Rome, these symbols became more popular and more widely understood. So, for example, in 312, Emperor Constantine dreamed that the Cairo would help him win an upcoming battle. So, he had his soldiers paint the Cairo symbol on their shields before the battle. And then he went into the battle and had a great victory and converted to Christianity afterwards. And during his reign, he moved the capital of Rome from Rome to Byzantium, which he renamed Constantinople, and the Cairo became... Uh, one of the most important symbols in Christian Byzantine art from that point on. Now, of course, many of these ancient Christian symbols are still used by Christians today in art and in worship. Uh, men and women wear every imaginable variation of the cross symbol on their clothes or on their jewelry. I'm sure most, if not all of you, have some sort of t-shirt with the cross on it or a cross necklace or something like that. Many Christians put the little like fish symbol on their cars. 
Christian art has continued to depict Jesus as being a strong and caring good shepherd. The cross is used by churches and Christians in art. It's just a symbol of hope and the gospel to Christians all over the world. So the enduring popularity of these symbols kind of demonstrates the power that beautiful symbolism has to communicate spiritual truth in just a beautiful physical way to people of diverse backgrounds, cultures, and all that. So if history is any indication, these symbols will continue to move and inspire the minds and hearts of Christians for many years to come. So I hope you all found that interesting. If you're interested in learning more, I'll include um, some links that were helpful to me in my research that you might like to um, explore. But anyway, I hope you all have a beautiful and God-glorifying week. Bye, guys!